I always say uh, we shouldn't scare the children, so uh, I hope uh, you're not scared too much. I mean, uh, uh, by this caricature of mind, specifically because we now at uh, venue Capital on the Park, which I see yesterday had some sort of a baboon here. So I hope after the presentation, you don't think this is the baboon that was, uh, that was here yesterday and that wasn't captured yet. I'm here to talk to you today about asset classes. Now, normally you would know that uh, at Momentum Investments, we take a long-term view. We take uh, asset class views through the cycle. So whatever that might mean, that's normally a longer-term horizon, 10, 15 years view. And that's why I normally, when I come to the Outcome Matters presentations, I normally spend some time talking to you about scenarios of the future. And those of you that have been to pre previous Outcome Matters presentations that I've done, you would know that I talk about scenarios a lot and say, you know, what are the asset classes likely to do in the different scenarios, our base case, our best case, our worst case. But today I'm, I'm taking a bit of a different tack. Because not only do we do uh, and we build and construct portfolios on the long-term uh, horizon, we also do look at what markets are likely to do in the shorter term. Because we want to make sure that we are, an, we are able to put a tactical slant on our portfolios as well. So even though we might be bullish or bearish about a specific asset class over the next, let's call it 10 years, there might be specific fundamentals or valuation issues that either say to us that we must be a little bit more careful because we're inducing too much risk in our portfolios in the short term by taking the long-term view only, and therefore we want to put a little bit of a tactical slant on it and maybe protect our portfolios a little bit in the interim, let's call it the next 12 to 18 months, or there are opportunities, even though we don't like the asset class in the long run, there might be opportunities because the asset class is down and out at the moment. The valuations give you a positive return signal over the next 12 to 18 months. So I'm going to talk very much today about our view on asset classes for the next 12 to 18 months. And how I'm going to do it is I'm going to first look at the global asset classes, particularly bonds and equities. And I'm going to talk about the fundamentals and the valuations over the next 12, let's say 18 months kind of period and say, you know, how do we see the developments at the moment? Do we think we need to take some protection out on some of our long-term strategic uh, asset class views? Or do we think there are opportunities in the next 12 to 18 months for these asset classes? And then I'll come into the local asset classes and do exactly the same, talk a little bit about some of the fundamentals over the next 12 to 18 months for the local asset classes and look at the valuations as well. And then right at the end tell you that you know, this, these are our kinds of all-over conclusions for asset classes on a 12 to 18-month view. Now, I hope you're not, uh, or you're still at a specific high after the World Cup win, so I, I can't not talk and make some mention of rugby this morning. So I'll say that what I'm going to talk about today is very much the pool strategy that Rossi had to get us through the pools. So when we played through the pools, this was the strategy of the tactical asset allocation. But remember, the strategic asset allocation is the long-term view, how are we going to win the final? So that's very much the rugby analogy that I'll leave with you this morning of what I'm going to talk to you today. How do we win against Japan relative to how do we win in the long run the World Cup, which is our strategic asset allocation, the way that we do portfolios. So let's start on the global asset class side. And we'll talk about the fundamentals and the valuations uh, a little bit. And on the global side, if we took, talk about global equities, global bonds, here and we look at the fundamentals, there are three issues I want to discuss in this section. The first one is to talk about the rising recession probability in the world, because that has certain implications for asset classes. Equities, for instance, don't like it when you have a rising recession probability, and particularly if recession does happen. Bonds do. So again, there's a, there's a specific uh, lesson to be learned from that. Secondly, um, I'll talk about the fact that we are probably going to live with high volatility for the next couple of years, and that has specific implications for our portfolios. So we'll talk about a couple of issues there. And then finally, we'll talk about valuations on global equities and global uh, bonds. And we'll make the point that it's here uh, an environment that we envisage for the next couple of years when none of these asset classes are particularly cheap, so it becomes more of a relative game. So you dance with the least ugly sister over the next 12 to 18 months rather than uh, really uh, pick and choose of all the pretty sisters. So from that perspective, those are the three elements I'll discuss on the global side with you today. 
The first one on the global recession probability, the rising risk of global recession in the next, uh, let's call it 12 to 18 months. The Citigroup did a machine learning algorithm where they looked at data over the last 20 years odd, and they had a look at which kind of data sets do produce the best results of trying to predict the recession. And at the moment, it's showing us that there's more than a 60% probability for a recession in the, in the U.S. over the next 12 months. And you'll see that every time that we reach those kind of 60% uh, probabilities on the red lines, uh, ultimately, these blocks, they do depict the recessionary outcomes that were actual recessions. They predicted it pretty well uh, in advance. So we've got to start saying in our portfolios, even though we might like global equities on a 10-year view, let's be a little bit careful and maybe take some protection uh, because we have an environment that the uh, probability for recession is starting to increase. Another way of looking at it, uh, another investment bank, Morgan Stanley, they've got seven models that they look at, and their probability measure is showing that over the next 12 months, they think that we're likely to see a recession somewhere with a probability between 10 and 40%, roughly. So again, not negligible kind of environment for potential recession over the next uh, 12 months or so. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because the recessions in the U.S. is normally associated with equity bear markets. And remember, equity bear markets normally defined as 20% fall from the top. You'll see 15 uh, recessions over the last 100 years in the U.S. This is on the uh, left-hand side of this specific slide where the e economy peaked and when it troughed. This is the recession era. 15 of them, and we saw big drawdowns peak to trough uh, in most of them. So I say it's mostly, um, and I'll sort of uh, show these kind of periods where officially there wasn't bear market because the market didn't go down by 20% or more. But from a client experience perspective, it was still negative because, for instance, in this latest one that wasn't uh, depicted as a bear market, the U.S. stock market still went down by 17%. Now, again... Client experience, whether you go down by 22 or 17, is very much similar. So all I want to say to you is that if we have an environment where we are going to see a recession, and, we, and there's no 100% probability that we are going to see a recession, but we're seeing a rising risk, we've got to say, okay, watch out. We need to protect portfolios against the downside. So again, that, uh, that makes the point. Another way of making the point is to say that, you know, equities don't like recessions. This is the 12-month performance of all these asset classes on the left-hand side uh, into a recession and then the 12-month performance subsequent to recession. And what you'll see here is a lot of negative numbers uh, on the equity block. So these are all different equity markets. and You'll see a lot of negative numbers and very red e equity numbers subsequent to recession, but very much not a great story for equities. So again, making the point that equities don't like recessions. If you look at the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield, you'll see here some green, and you'll see some green afterwards as well. E uh, sort of uh, global bond, uh, government bonds in the U.S. very much a safe haven in an environment of recession. You'll see gold. I highlight gold there as well. Um, you see gold normally runs ahead of recession. So by the time of recession, uh, when that uh, uh, starts happening, it's already had its run. But it's at least a hedge before recession happens, against the recession. You would have uh, probably seen in the press, in the financial press specifically, the last number of months, increased mention of an inverted yield curve in the U.S., because that's normally also used as a powerful predictor of potential recession happening afterwards. We haven't seen a recession yet that wasn't uh, forecasted by a negative yield curve. Now, the yield curve, and this is now specifically the 10-year, 2-year yield curve uh, in the U.S., that inverted in August of this year. Now, again, if you look at uh, the start of the U.S. recessions and uh, when the yield curve in inverted and when the equity market peaked, quite interesting, a couple of ob observations. Firstly, it takes about 11 months from when the, uh, the yield curve inverts until the stock market peaks. So about 11 months on average. I mean, obviously, there are differences between how quickly they do. I mean, they could sort of uh, peak already two months after the yield curve inversion and as long, take as long as 18, but on average about 11 months. Um, and that uh, between that uh, S&P peak 
the S&P peak is always before the recession. So it takes then another five months between the S&P peak and the recession. So if we say we had an August curve inversion in the U.S., roughly on average, you should expect by the middle of next year about the S&P peak, and then by the end of next year, probably U.S. recession, if the yield curve is 100% predictor, or yield curve inversion is 100% predictor of, uh, of eventual recession. You will also see, however, that uh, the performance between the curve inversions and when the S&P 500 peaks is still quite decent. Normally, the market goes up by another 13%. So you also don't want to be pulling the trigger and just get out of equities the moment the yield curve inverts because you miss performance. But what we need to make sure of is that we do need to know that somewhere along the line, from now until probably early in 2021, if the yield curve is a correct in in indicator this time as well of a recession, the equity market could come under some strain, and therefore, again, we need to take out some protection. Can it be avoided? Yes, of course it can. Depends on what policymakers are going to do globally, and particularly the U.S. Um, well, I mean, central banks have already started easing policy. Uh, this graph is actually quite interesting. If you look at the red line on the graph, beginning of this year, we had more central banks still hiking interest rates, putting interest rates up relative to those that were cutting interest rates. Now you'll see that about 16 or 17 more central banks are cutting rates than hiking rates. So they've already started reacting to the economic environment by uh, uh, stimulating the economy from interest rate side. And that, uh, the blue line, which is the manufacturing uh, 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 PMI in the, in the globe, that normally after six months start moving in, in line with what happens on the monetary policy front. So if monetary policy is easing, you could expect sort of the next six months, maybe manufacturing production will start uh, moving a little bit on the upside because of all the interest rate stimulus that's been put into the economy from interest rate cuts. The second one, monetary policy these days, not only interest rates, we've known it uh, since the global financial crisis, as also uh, consisting not only of interest rates, but also of quantitative easing. So the buying of financial assets by central banks, and if they buy it, they obviously have to pay for it, and they therefore uh, transfer money into the economy, and that underpins then the economic in environment. Now what you saw the last couple of years, this is the black line, is the, uh, the combination of all of these central banks, their QEs, so the total, the aggregated number, you saw that this peaked sort of late 17. So for roughly for the last two years, they've pushed less and less money into the economy because they were buying less and less financial assets. But look at the forecast. This is now obviously a forecast from Citi, but I mean, this is well known because central banks are telling us what they're going to do. So it's a little bit better than just a spy in the sky kind of forecast. The black line is forecasted to go up because of what central banks are telling us. The European Central Bank is telling us we're going to be out there now and going to buy again uh, uh, as financial assets, and therefore we will be pushing money into the European economy. Not only the European economy, but the global economy. The Fed is telling us the same. The Bank of Japan is telling us the same. So again, we have this underpin also then from this perspective uh, from quantitative easing. So not only interest rates are falling, but central banks are telling us we're going to put more money into the economy, which... Uh, should uh, have a positive impact. If it's, good, if it's big enough, then recession can be avoided. If it's not big enough, then we will be in recession, let's say, late next year, early 2021, and that obviously will mean that before then, equity markets will start coming under some pressure. So that's on the recession variable. Rising volatility likely over the next uh, while. Why? Firstly, because of what we've seen on that yield curve. The yield curve is indicative of more stress in the economic system. And if it's indicative of more stress in the economic system, it normally has an upward um, implication for the VIX, the equity market uh, volatility indicator in the U.S. So uh, again, what I've got here is the VIX in red. So the VIX uh, volatility is sort of leveled out at these kind of levels. But what the flattening of the yield curve is telling us, the blue line, is that over the next number of years, we're going to see the VIX moving up. So you're going to see over many months that Either the market is coming down or it's moving up and up and down all the time. So from that volatility indicator, we're starting to see, let's be careful out there because we are probably going to see higher volatility than we've been accustomed to in the U.S. stock market over the next number of years. And we need to take that into our portfolios. Secondly, we've got this other phenomenon, which we call the 
Twitter in chief globally, which is uh, President Trump. He is tweeting more and more and inducing volatility into financial markets as well. So I show on this specific graph uh, the tweets that originates from him. Earlier this year, uh, relative to now, he's now tweeting twice as much now than what he did at the early part of this year. But he also on send stuff, remember those memes that we always take and then we pass on to all our, our friends or whatever, that's the red line. So all the stuff that he does himself plus whatever he takes and just uh, retweets, uh, three times more now than at the beginning of the year. You might say, oh, it's much of a muchness. Uh, does it really matter for, for markets? Well, firstly, he's tweeting more on stuff that is market moving. So what you have here is we've got the total number of tweets in gray. You've got the stuff that he uh, tweets on the trade side, which is uh, anything that mentions the dollar, trade, farmers, China, tariff, whatever. And you'll see there uh, that has increased. Now, of all his tweets, one in ten is now on trade, on one of those things. So it is potential market, potentially market moving. And then monetary, monetary policy if you want, economy, inflation, federal, reserve, Powell. Remember he said Powell's an idiot. Whatever, he comes out to that every couple of, uh, couple of tweets. Then he says, you know, uh, yes, I've put in trade restrictions and uh, trade war issues, and, but I want Powell to actually cut interest rates because this is now starting to hurt a little bit the, the U.S. economy. Now, one in 15 is on monetary policy. And what, you can sh what I also show on the next one is to show you that whereas per month, in the beginning part of this year, about two to three tweets per month moved the U.S. bond market, which is the most liquid market probably apart from currencies uh, in the world. Now more than 30 tweets per month move the bond market. So, you know, obviously we don't have 30 working days every year, so the bond market is not open for 30 days, but it's more than one tweet per day, working day, that now influences the bond market to move it either up or down because of what it's doing. So what he's doing is he's, he is inducing more volatility in financial markets by tweeting on monetary policy, tweeting on trade, which is totally different from previous presidents, by the way. I mean, they kept quiet about monetary policy in totality. So this is different, but we've got to work with that because we've got to realize that that induces volatility into financial markets. The third element on the global side, just talking about uh, very few assets that are now cheap versus history. What, we've, what uh, Morgan Stanley has done here is they looked at the last 20 years on number of asset classes. You'll see there you've got equities, you've got bonds, you've got credit, you've got forex, you've got commodities. And they looked at the 20-year valuation time horizon and where we are now relative to that 20 year. And in this instance, more on the green side is good. So green means good valuations, red doesn't mean so good valuations. And you'll see here that more on the gold side and the emerging market debt side are the only two asset classes that are looking more on the cheap side. You see the rest are either fair value or they're on the expensive side. If you look at, and we're talking here about global equities and global bonds, global equities, that's the Morgan Stanley All Country World Index, so global equity. You'll see that very much neutral, slightly below neutral, so slightly on the expensive side of neutral, but let's call it fair value, based on its 20-year average on a forward PE. Uh, so let's call it equity fair value. If you look at uh, rates, which is government bonds, you'll see the U.S. Treasury there, German Treasury, and uh, Japanese Treasury, they're all on the very negative side here. Yeah. I mean, you look at yeah, the German Treasury, Bund yield is now at its most expensive in 20 years because they are trading at minus 80 basis points nominal. And that's on the 10-year. They're trading now negative through the whole yield curve up to the 30-year level. So the German government now issues 30-year bonds to investors. Well, whether investors, it's debatable if they would buy them, but they, they issue these 30-year bonds at negative nominal yield. So it means that if you're an investor, you pay a certain price, let's call it 100, you will get 100 minus at the end of 30 years as your total return, assuming you hold the bond for obviously 30 years. So it makes no sense for you as an as a, as a investor in the bond market strategically to be very aggressive in the German bond market. That's also why you will see that the U.S. Treasury market, you might say, well, you know, Treasury yields are 175, not great. A hell of a lot better than some of the other bond yields because they're still positive, firstly, so you make capital gains over the 10-year that you own that bond. 
and you're not paying the government, as in, the, in Germany, for the privilege of actually lending their money. Makes no sense whatsoever. Think about your own mortgage rate, and you can uh, see how ridiculous that is if you uh, find that you go to the bank and says, I want to take a 30-year mortgage, uh, 5 million on my house, um, and the bank says, oh, we will pay you to come and uh, borrow money from us. I mean, that's very much a similar analogy. In any case, so uh, very few assets cheap, uh, but equities fair value probably relative to their 20-year average. Bonds are massively expensive, uh, but that's not the reason why we buy bonds. We buy bonds because we are worried about the risk of recession over the next 12 months, um, and particularly the U.S. bond market. So we wouldn't go and buy German bond deals at negative yields, neither German uh, and so forth. So we would look at something like a U.S. Treasury market, say, well, at least we've got 175 um, over the next uh, 10 years. So from that perspective, that's a, a positive uh, environment to, to look at uh, in a recessionary kind of uh, environment. Are these asset classes priced for recession? Well, bonds are, equities are not. Again, a similar kind of exercise showing here that S&P 500, at the current valuation, it's trading at a forward PE roughly around 17 times. It's saying there's no recession on the horizon. So again, if recession does happen, uh, they're in for a, for quite a decent surprise. The, the U.S. equity market. Bonds, uh, in general, I mean, we're talking about, again, yeah, U.S. Uh, bonds, but bonds are, for, uh, 175 says there's a recession coming. Remember, the bond market was 3% yield 18 months ago. Now it's 175. So it's indicative of potentially recession. So if recession does happen, bond market's probably not going to rally that much because it's already factoring in recession. But the equity market's going to sell off significantly, and I showed the numbers. So they could be quite significant. They could be 50% down, uh, even in a recession. If recession doesn't happen, the bond market's going to sell off, because the bond market's now discounting recession, and the equity market will probably just stay where it is, because it's already discounting there's no recession coming. So you can sort of uh, see the kind of way that we think about these markets when we build these portfolios and look at the tactical overlays that we've got to put in the portfolios depending on whether recession will be happening or not. That's on the global side. I'll do exactly the same on some of the local asset classes. And uh, we'll start off by looking at SA equity, because that's the big one, the big gorilla in the room. And again, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial now and say that past performance is a great indicator of future performance in reverse. If you had no performance the last five years, you've got a better chance in the next five years to get actually decent performance. So I'll make that point uh, in, a, in a couple of graphs. Secondly, a lot of people, and we've had a discussion earlier uh, outside to say, you know, the economy is in dire straits in South Africa. Why on earth would you want to buy SA equity? Well, SA equity is not SA economy. 60, 65% of our, of our profits, of our co corporates listed on the JSE doesn't come from the SA economy. It's got nothing to do with us. It's NASPERS, it's AB InBev, it's Richmond. So again, we can't say that the economy is dire. Don't invest in SA equities. Got nothing to do with it. Well, I say nothing is a bit of an over-exaggeration. Obviously, 35% still has. It's a, retail and a retailer and a bank and so forth. But uh, we need to be careful not to just equate the two to each other. We look at the impact of potential U.S. recession. I mean, what happens if there is a U.S. recession? US recession? Well, the SA equity market will not go unscathed. And I'll show you uh, that uh, even though it doesn't matter in the long run, it does matter in the short run. Right, let's first look at this uh, contrarian indicator that uh, if you didn't get any returns, potentially you will get some returns going in the future. I, had, I look at the data of the last roughly 55 years and had a look at uh, time periods when we had very low five-year rolling returns. These are only index returns on the Aussie. And I looked at, uh, at the time a couple of months ago, it was the five-year trailing index returns on the Aussie was 3.5%. And I said, okay, let's go back over the last 55 years, monthly data, and we go and have a look at what did the equity, how did the equity market perform subsequent to only getting 3.5% five-year trailing returns? Well, these numbers are quite significant. I mean, you'll see here uh, on one-year, two-year, three-year, five-year annualized returns, we're getting quite decent kind of numbers. So again, that's the first point to say that, you know, if you've got no returns, the valuations are now in your favor to get better returns going forward. We don't know whether the returns are going to happen in year one, year two, year three, or only on a five-year view, but uh, history is a little bit on your side as far as those returns are concerned. What about this sensitivity of the local equity market relative to uh, the economy? Well, I've already given, given the game away, spoiler alert, that I already told you 
that has got very little to do with each other, whether we're, growing great, were we going or growing great guns in South Africa or not. I'd look at the last, again, the last, uh, six, what is it, 58 years or so, and this is GDP, South Africa, the blue line, and I had a look at very high growth periods, 4% plus, and I said, okay, well, how did the equity market perform there? And then uh, below 1.5%, because that's the sort of the low end of the range, and I said, okay, how did the equity market perform here? And can we make any judgment calls on it? Well, these are the re results of, of that kind of period. If the GDP is less than 1.5%, you'll see that on average, we got 21% returns annualized um, during those periods. If you had GDP that grew at 4% or, or higher, we had average of 20%. So, no difference. There's a bit of a difference on the median because there are some outliers. But still, you know, again, even in an environment of low growth, we still got pretty decent kind of double-digit equity returns as median returns uh, in a low growth kind of environment. And again, that's the reason for that is that for a long time period, from 1960 to probably the late 80s, the South African equity market was resource-based. Mining companies were the big parts of the market which had very little to do with what happened to the SA economy. It had all to do with what happened to the global economy, global commodity prices, and the RAND. So again, that was the, the combination that drove it. Nowadays, it's obviously NASPERS, and it's Richmond, and it's ABN InBev, but predominantly NASPERS, which, again, NASPERS is not media 24. It's, very, it's a negative, and the stub is actually negative value. It's all NASPERS. Uh, it's all the Tencent. So from that perspective, it's got nothing to do with SA economy, but it's... 20% of the, well, more than 20% of the Aussie. <laughs> Again, that, that makes the, the point why this is the case. We do need to take uh, into account that if there's a recession, we need to be somewhat cautious in the shorter term around the onset of US recession because the SA equity market also take a, takes a knock. And I show this, again, this is the 12 months, 6 months, 3 months, and then uh, before onset of US recession, and then uh, time period of 12 months and up to 60 months, five years. First thing is, how we build portfolios, we couldn't care less about whether the U.S. recession is going to happen or not. Because it doesn't matter. In the long run, uh, if you look at the five years after recession, you know, SA equity, U.S. equity does pretty well. So again, that's a strategic asset allocation. Uh, Jaco de Jager will talk uh, just after me on our portfolios, and that's what you will see uh, why we don't actually worry about the short-term noise about recession, but we do worry about short-term noise when we look at the tactical overlay in our portfolios. Because we realize that in this kind of period, 12 months before recession, which roughly we probably now at, up to, let's call it 12 months after recession, you know, this, the market goes down. I mean, the scale, this is obviously because it's an average over those three months, so some, sometimes it's positive and negative, that's why it's not peak to trough. Peak to trough, I mean, the numbers also. 40 and 50% down in SA equity uh, from peak to trough during a U.S. recession. But on average, I mean, the, the numbers are, are quite negative. So again, from a tactical perspective, we want to say, let's care, be careful about SA equity in a U.S. recession kind of environment because there's probably, you know, somewhere between a 40 and a 60% probability of U.S. recession. If it doesn't happen, then, you know, SA equity market is a great buy at this stage. If it does happen, we just need to be careful and buy when it happens. Now, I know that's easy to say because when uh, an old colleague of mine always said that, you know, the market always thinks that somewhere between zero and infinity, the market always turns. So if it goes down, whether it's a share price of an all share or whatever, it's going to go to zero. If it goes up, it's going to go infinity. I mean, that thing is, I mean, NASPA is going to go to infinity, uh, but Steinhoff almost went to zero, <laughs> so that's maybe a bad example, but if a share price short term uh, is under pressure, then uh, everyone thinks it's going to zero. If you look at the valuations on the SA equity market, it's quite interesting that if you exclude NASPERS, the valuations are now looking quite decent. Uh, relative to the last year, uh, the last 16 years I think I did here, uh, last 16 years, it's about one standard deviation cheap now, that gray line, that's excluding NASPERS, the trailing PE, the red line is the including NASPAS, so you can see again how NASPAS since 2013 started distorting the SA equity market. That the valuations are now significantly higher. I mean, including NASPAS, I think the valuation now is somewhere around uh, 16 times trailing uh, PE. Excluding NASPAS, that's about, I think, about 
13 rough, uh, roughly uh, uh, Ford P. So again, from this perspective, we say, well, the SA equity market is looking on the cheap side um, relative to uh, past history. If you look at uh, Ford multiples, I mean, this is the Ford P of the all share. Now, this includes NASPAS, so I just have to give that first uh, as, as, a, as a proviso. Um, and this is, again, over the last 20 years, this is the mean, and it's plus one and minus one standard deviation over that last 20 years. Why the last 20 years? Well, it's since the emerging market crisis of 1998. We started seeing uh, the stabilization of this market. You also saw, started seeing since 2013, we started seeing the NASPAS effect. So NASPAS P at 40 and 50 times, that drove this all share forward PE quite significantly. So that's also why I've got this little short term, uh, the NASPAS era, I almost want to call it, uh, kind of average there. At the moment, the forward multiple is about 14 times. Uh, so it's sort of close to slightly below where the long term average is. So let's say on the slightly cheap side of fair value over the last 20 years on a forward multiple basis. Now what we do, and I'll show you the next slide, the kind of return forecast. Now we don't know what the market's going to do in the next 12 months. No one does, knows that. But what we say is that if we keep the valuation at the long-term average, and we do that over five years, and we then do that gradually over the next five years, so we take this 14 and we take it to 14.6, which is that number, over five years, so it basically goes from 14, uh, port multiple, one year out, 14, one, 14, two, three, four, five, and then we get to 14, six roughly in five years' time. What will the equity returns look like? If we just take it back to that 20-year uh, average, and then in our best case, we say, okay, but let's take it to the one standard deviation line, plus one standard deviation over the next five years. So obviously there's a bigger move up in uh, re-rating of the market over the next 12 months, and then we say, well, our best case must take this down to this minus one standard deviation line over the next 12 months, so we derate the market over the next five years uh, in a systematic way, and that gives us these kind of returns. So again, our base case, which is that taking it to 14.6 from current 14.2, uh, that gives us about 15% one-year returns. So that's sort of a proxy for what we can expect uh, from a valuation perspective on SA equity. If we do the bull case, we take it to the one standard deviation line, we, uh, we say that we take it to 17.7 from 14.2, then we get about 20% return in year one. And if we take it the bear case down to uh, 11 and a half, we get about 10% return. So somewhere between 10 and 20 is probably a number that we can work with uh, from a bear to a base to a bull case on SA equity as our expectations. If you look at SA bonds and cash, I mean, the bond story is very much a hunt for yield story. Globally, there's no yield, so everyone hunts for yields in the emerging world. Because remember, the developed market world gives you negative nominal and now negative real as well um, returns. If you look at uh, uh, how South Africa's real bonds are attractive, they're not only attractive relative to DM, developed markets, they're also attractive relative to emerging markets, they're also attractive relative to our own history. So we've got three tick marks on SA real yields at the moment. So that's why we do like SA bonds. Real cash, I mean, it was better one year ago, but it's still giving you decent kind of risk-adjusted returns. So again, from that perspective, for a 12-month view, it's not an asset class we would love on a 20-year view or a 10-year view, um, because it normally gives you a CPI plus one and a half. That's sort of the, the long-term average. Uh, but at the moment, it's giving us CPI plus three. So we say, oh, that's actually pretty decent in an environment where we're worried about rising uh, probability for recession out there in the world. So let's look at this hunt for yield. Well, this tells basically the story, telling you that corporate bonds and global government bonds now of a value of 17 trillion is trading in negative yield territory nominal. So again, that story about, you know, we are paying these guys to lend their money if we invest here. 17 trillion. Now look at the the situation five years back. Not one single bond was trading in negative nominal territory. So again, that's been a, quite a significant uh, um, story. And that obviously makes it more attractive where there are, they are, where they are still uh, positive yields available in nominal and then in real yields terms. Now this is real yields, not nominal. Look at developed markets. Look here, just negative numbers. I mean, you can see that the best of the bunch, again, the least ugly sister if you want, um, is the U.S., because in real terms, that gives you about zero. It still gives you nominal 1.75, but the inflation is also 1.75, so that's why real yields are zero. Um, but look at Japan, U.K., Europe. That's, there's the, because obviously Germany is big in there, and Italy as well. 
They give you negative real returns because they give ne negative nominal in, some inst in most instances. Then look at EM, positive numbers. So that's why global capital likes EM bonds. Remember, and it's also cheap. I showed you EM dollar bonds together with gold, only two asset classes that are looking cheap relative to their 20-year averages. And look at South Africa within EM. And I didn't, there is no EM that's got bigger, a higher yield than SA in real terms. Because remember, our bond is roughly trading at nine, 10 year bond, and our inflation is roughly four and a half. So that's why roughly we've got four and a half real yield. Now look at Mexico, it's got three and a half, and Brazil as well, Russia about two and a half, and Turkey's still negative because Turkey's got 18% inflation. So again, if you look at South Africa, bond yields not only looking great relative to DM and EM, but also relative to its own history. This is the South African real bond yield over time since we've had inflation targeting. That's why, uh, because the whole uh, story changed for SA bonds when we started in, in, uh, uh, sort of introducing inflation targeting. Uh, look at there. We still have more than 4% real returns at the moment. I showed you the number just now in a, uh, a moment ago, 4.6%. Um, but this is with our forecast inflation, so this is slightly, uh, slightly lower real yield because our forecast inflation is slightly higher over the next 12 months than the current number of around 4.5. So we say, well, we're roughly going to have 4.9, let's call it 5% inflation the next 12 months because of some food inflation impacts and so forth. But 4% uh, still a decent kind of return in real terms relative to this long-term average of 3% real. So historically, we got 3% real on SA bonds. Now we get 4%. Yes, it was greater one, month, one year ago when it was 5% real. But it's still decent at 4% real. If you look at SA cash, just relative to its past history, again, one year ago, we got uh, roughly around 4% real on SA cash. Now we get 3% real on SA cash. Still decent, but uh, very much in line now with its long-term average since uh, inflation targeting. So again, uh, from a risk-adjusted perspective, cash also looking decent from a tactical asset allocation perspective next 12 months or so. Listed property. Lots of bad news discounted. Uh, I'll show you uh, the fact that it's the cheapest in 10 years versus bonds. Um, and even if we kitchen sink all the assumptions, we're now starting to get these green signals when we look at our strategic asset allocation for the next 10 years. Might not be so for the next year, but we are happy to own listed property in a meaningful way with a 10-year view through the cycle because you've now kitchen sinked everything. This is one of those that are never going to pick up again. You'll talk to many asset. Remember, we, we do, single, as, uh, we do uh, single asset classes, but we also talk to many of the other managers. So other managers will come in, and I have very few of the other managers that are telling me that they are happy to own this in an overweight basis uh, on, 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 on listed property. Normally it tells me, okay, it's the time to actually look at it quite seriously, and, and that's what we've done. You only, in order to get negative returns and still see listed property going down over the next 12 months, you've got to make very unrealistic kind of tail risk assumptions on listed property, and I'll, I'll show you that uh, in a little while. This is that graph to show you two things. Firstly, the relative valuation of listed property versus bonds. That's the red line here. So again, uh, because I've defined it at listed property distribution yield over uh, the bond yield, it means that if the red line goes down, it means that listed property is re-rating against bonds. Now, what you've seen over the last couple of years, you've seen actually a de-rating of listed property distribution yield relative to the bond yield. At the, the peak of the market, Listed property was trading at a 40% premium to bonds on their yields. They're now trading close to a 10% discount. There's no way they should, on a continuous basis, trade at a discount because it's not only an income-generating asset. There's also capital growth involved, which you don't get, uh, obviously, uh, necessarily from a, from a fixed income instrument. So again, from that perspective, we're saying, well, this is starting to show us that the last time it was at these kind of levels was there. When was this? Global financial crisis. We're not in a global financial crisis. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity if we take a 10-year view on this specific asset class. So what we do here, I know it's a lot of numbers, but I'll, I'll just focus on the red ones here. This is our base case for our returns. Again, we're trying to, to guess a return with a bit of an, 
let's call it a calculated guess on a listed property. And we say, say, well, normally listed property, the distribution growth should be in line with inflation. So let's call it negative, uh, sort of a zero real. But at the moment, we're saying, well, we know the economy is weak. Shopping centers are under pressure. Uh, look around us here at Santon. You look at the offices, a lot of vacant space, 12, 13% vacant space around us here, and so forth. So we are not going to see zero real. We are going to see zero nominal in the next year. So that's negative, roughly negative five uh, real in, uh, in distribution growth. So we are being conservative here. Analysts, uh, all the property analysts out there, they're forecasting, they say, now we're going to get 2% nominal. We say, well, they're probably too optimistic as they normally are, so we, we don't believe them, so we'll take it down a little bit. Zero nominal, 8.5% exit bond yield, which is our fair value on the bond yield for the next 12 months, and we say that 1.06, that's the number that that, bond yield, uh, that that distribution yield is at the moment trading relative to the bond yield. So no re-rating, no de-rating either, but we're keeping it 106, then it gets at least more than 10% uh, returns over the next 12 months likely. We say, well, we can kitchen sink this a little bit more. Let's see, when do we get negative returns? I have to take all of these down, obviously, combination of all of this. So let's look at a 9% bond yield in South Africa. Uh, we say, well, nominal distribution is not going to be zero. It's going to be minus two. And we say, well, let's take it to that worst that it's ever traded against the... Uh, uh, the bond market in the global financial crisis, 1.13 was the number, and then we start getting these negative numbers. So you really have to kitchen sink it and take very negative, almost unrealistic kind of assumptions into your numbers to get negative returns to still see listed property share prices lower in 12 months' time than what they are at the moment. We can be a little slightly a bit more po pos positive and take our, base, uh, our, our bullish case, and we say, well, let's use the analyst numbers of 2% distribution growth normal, uh, we take the bond yield down a little bit, but we still don't re-rate the market. We keep it at current rating, uh, and then we get about roughly 20% returns. So again, you'll see the asymmetric side of this, that yes, there's probably a downside still for the listed property side, but it's, you know, it's pretty, you've got to take very aggressive negative assumptions in there, and that uh, the upside is much more significant than the downside. So again, when we look at portfolios, particularly this is obviously a one-year view, if you go a little bit further out, then that number is going to be closer to inflation as we go roll two to three to four to five years down the line. That distribution growth is going to be somewhere like four or five percent. And then suddenly this kind of return looks much more interesting on a five-year annualized kind of, kind of, kind of uh, uh, scenario. So let's put all of this together and say what is our asset class conclusions. And again, remember, this is pool games, not ultimate World Cup winning. Because the World Cup winning is the strategic asset allocation. This is the next 12 months view, uh, maybe 18 months. We like SA asset classes more than global asset classes. Why? Because the valuations are looking much better. And maybe you have some RAND appreciation as well, if we're lucky. But we don't bet on the RAND, appreci uh, rand appreciation somewhat. I mean, the RAND, again, has seen significant weakness. So there's a lot of negative bad news in the RAND as it stands. Because you might ask me, you know, what about a Moody's downgrade or whatever? It's already in the price. What about the bond yields already in the price? So uh, maybe the day or the week of the Moody's downgrade, bond yields will go up and uh, uh, RAND might go weaker. But after that, it'll normalize once again because our yields are attractive enough for foreigners to come in. And as they bring money in, the RAND will strengthen again and bond yields will go down. Global bonds versus equities. I made the points about rising recession risk. So that's why in the next 12 months, we favor bonds, and that's government bonds, and particularly U.S. bonds, because we don't want to go and buy those German bunds at uh, minus 85 basis points nominal, uh, but particularly U.S. bonds over equities, because we're taking some risk off the table. We're putting some protection in our portfolios as well on the global uh, equity side. On SA equity, valuations on our side, but there's a risk of this recession in the U.S. that's not going to be good for us at the onset of that recession. Remember I showed you in the roughly the six, six months before recession and roughly then up to uh, six or so months after recession, SA equities also don't do that well. Uh, we will see that as a massive buying opportunity. So at the moment we say, well, let's rather put protection in there. We, we like the asset class from a valuation perspective. And, and if recession doesn't happen in the U.S., we don't want to be stuck with a massively underweight uh, equity position. 
uh, in South Africa, but we'll put some protection in for that risk, risk of U.S. recession. SA nominal bonds, overweight, I think it's, uh, I've made the points on the real yields. Hunt for yield is a big positive underpin, and that remains so. ILBs, uh, I didn't really show them, but I wanted to include them here because it's part of the bond asset class. Uh, at the moment, underweight, because it doesn't show us uh, good value, and we prefer the nominal bonds. They look much more interesting than the, than the real uh, bonds at the moment. But again, in our portfolios, and Jakob might show that a little bit later on, they feature on a 10-year view through the cycle. Don't want to have zero inflation linkers. Uh, and they've also improved in their valuation the last couple of, uh, couple of years. I mean, two years ago, we had nothing, even in our sort of uh, 12 to 24 months kind of view. Now we're starting to say, well, we're still underweight, but we don't have nothing. We have a little bit of them because they're looking a little bit more interesting. Cash, on a real risk-adjusted basis, they look still decent, so particularly in this kind of environment. So that's why they've got the overweight there. Enlisted property, we're sort of sitting on the fence, uh, but a lot of guys will be underweight here. But we say, well, we're neutral on it because we like the strategic view and we think, you know, there's decent upside. If our base case comes to fruition, we'll get 12.5% uh, kind of returns over the next uh, one year. Uh, but longer term, they're actually looking like a, I don't want to call it a steal, because uh, uh, I might be proven wrong, but I don't think so, because if you look at the real kind of returns that this asset class might give you, it's something like 6 or 7% on a 10-year view, as our, our calculations show. At the moment, they, uh, they are uh, looking maybe a little bit more iffy because of the economic kind of environment. I'll stop there, and uh, Renee, do we have time for slider questions that uh, have come through? Thank you very much. <laughs> Growth assets disappointed in recent years, now priced favorably from a valuation. What needs to change for value and the assets to be unlocked? Uh, well, we never know. I mean, I've spent, I've spent 25 years uh, in different areas of financial markets, and we've always tried to guess what will be the catalyst. And I've spent umpteen presentations about talking about potential catalysts. And we always get them wrong because we thought it was that one and then it, something left field came. We don't know. We think that valuations, if they're in your favor, the growth assets will, uh, will you know, uh, perform well, whatever the catalyst is. The catalyst might be something that the, there is no U.S. recession. That maybe the Fed cuts rates to zero and puts QE infinity in place, and that causes a rare, because there's obviously not going to be a recession in that kind of environment, that causes a massive rally in global uh, assets, and then obviously that has a, a risk on kind of uh, environment, uh, put the risk on environment right through the, the system, and that will underpin all these growth assets. Uh, I mean, I can go on with 15 potential catalysts. We never know which they are going to be. They always come from a, probably an area that you don't know. On a single asset view, it sounds like alpha is going to be hard to come by. On a single asset view, is this not the very case for multi-assets? Don't we still expect them to suffer? Well, I don't know. I mean, some of these single assets look pretty decent. I mean, if you look at the kind of returns that we're projecting for SA equity as a building block, I mean, they look pretty decent. I mean, again, I don't, there wasn't an indication of the time horizon. Um, but again, if you look at the time horizon, even over the next year or two, if we don't have a U.S. recession, I mean, they're quite decent returns. We can get up to 20% returns on SA equity. So I think the building block itself is pretty decent. I would always say because our view is that outcome-based investing is multi-asset. Diversification is your friend. It's the only free lunch. Uh, we would say, yes, multi-asset, obviously. But even some of the asset classes individually, the building blocks, might give you decent returns. I mean, I showed SA bonds, real returns of four. I mean, that's great. I mean, even more higher than maybe uh, on, the, on the SA equity side. Anything more? No? That's it. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, your time.